thank you very much to all of you uh, for your presence this evening. I'm Benjamin Haute Couverture. I'm a senior research fellow at the Fondation for la Recherche Stratégique uh, in Paris. And uh, we have uh, this terrific opportunity to have uh, Dr. Lassina Zerbo, the uh, executive secretary of the um, CTBTO in Vienna with us in Paris uh, today. So I will shortly introduce uh, Dr. Zerbo. Then we will have a short talk with uh, uh, Benoit uh, and, and I and, and, and uh, Mr. Se Executive Secretary. And then we will open the floor in order for you to have a direct contact with uh, Dr. Zerbo yes. and to ask uh, whatever question you want to ask him and to open the debate on, on, on uh, nuclear uh, issues uh, 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 as to the CTBT, of course, the treaty, the organization, and naturally beyond this uh, uh, detailed subject. So, uh, Dr. Zerbo, you are the executive secretary of the CTBTO, a position which you assumed on uh, August 2013. You previously served as director of the uh, organization's international data center, the IDC, and in November 2016, uh, the member states reappointed you to a further four-year term uh, until July 2021. You are very familiar with France and uh, with Paris. We always have the pleasure to welcome you at the Fondation for la Recherche Stratégique when you come and visit us in Paris. But this year, we have the great pleasure to welcome you jointly with the Paris School of International Affairs of Sciences Po uh, in order for you to have that direct exchange with uh, our young generation, uh, since uh, we uh, all know that you are very interested in um, employing the youngest generation on these topics. You uh, created in 2016, I'm sure you will uh, address this, uh, the, the youth group, the CTBTO youth group, which um, has uh, just published his annual report uh, available on the, on the website of the CTBTO. <clears throat> Allow me first to congratulate you for being awarded yesterday uh, by the American Association for the Advancement of Science at the winner of its 2018 Science Diplomacy Award uh, in recognition uh, of your commitment to eliminating, of course, nuclear testing. And you were awarded because, I quote, you repeatedly demonstrated your profound skill at promoting dialogue and interaction among scientists, policymakers, academics, and civil society, and encouraging diverse groups to work collaboratively. And uh, the announcement said, and I definitely could not say it better, uh, if I may. And in the answer uh, you made yesterday, you mentioned three points. Uh, the first one is the political tension in the Korean Peninsula. The second one is the eight ratifications still necessary to bring the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty uh, into force. Uh, which are China, Egypt, Iran, Israel, the US, plus three non-signatory -sign states, the DPRK, India, and Pakistan. And the third point was the current verification regime that is, you said, second to known, although we still, I quote you, must capture the political will. And uh, with this, I'd stop my remarks because these three points, I think, concentrate the main challenges that we will focus on with you. Uh, 
I'll give you the floor for a presentation. We'll be followed by a short discussion with Professor Pedro Pidas and I, and then we will open the, the floor for a disc direct discussion between you and the floor during one hour. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Benjamin. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. So let me begin by uh, thanking you uh, and uh, your Fondation pour la Recherche Scientifique and Sciences Po, a School of International Affairs, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. So as I talk about the opportunity, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm a little bit, uh, you know, I have a little pinch in my heart because I was uh, hoping to grab the opportunity to speak in French. And then uh, I come in Paris, uh, a place where I was, and then I'm basically forced to speak in English. Uh, so it, it's, I would say it's a little bit of a disaster uh, because I wanted to, I don't, for the past 25 years, I haven't been speaking English at all. So you make me lose a wonderful opportunity to talk in French. And uh, so I won't forgive you for that. But anyway, let's uh, continue in French or in English, sorry. <laughs> So Benjamin, thank you, and then thank you uh, to all of you for being here. I know it's not easy on a Valentine's Day at your age uh, to be at uh, 5, uh, uh, 15 listening to somebody who is talking about uh, burning nuclear test explosion. Uh, so I want to say thank you. Thank you for being here. Your Valentine is a nuclear test ban Valentine, and then uh, I congratulate you for that. So I wish uh, I could bring a rose with uh, a mushroom cloud uh, to give to you all, but anyway, we can have that in our mind. But anyway, thank you for being here. It's a special pleasure for me uh, to be at Sciences Po. Uh, I'm, uh, as a graduate uh, in geophysics from uh, Paris 6 and Paris 11, uh, I'm familiar with the standing of uh, your institution. Sciences Po is known to be, a, you know, not only a great place, but a wonderful place. And I'm here with uh, one of your uh, alumni, it's uh, Maria Cipurina. So she's now working at the CTBTO with me. She's a Sciences Po student, uh, graduate from 2011. And uh, so, you know, I'm sorry for her as well because I was telling her she's, uh, she met her husband here and then I said, I'm bringing her on Valentine's Day because her husband is in Paris. And I found out that the husband is in Switzerland. So, you know. Uh, she's having a nuclear test Valentine as well with us today, but uh, Maria, thanking, uh, thank you for bringing me back to, to Sciences Po. But I mean, uh, for nearly 150 years, uh, your institution has contributed to uh, educating prominent thinkers and leaders. So eight French presidents are coming from uh, Sciences Po, 13 prime ministers, and uh, the former United Nations Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali from Egypt are uh, few but notable one who have gone through your institution and I'm sure you guys are proud of this. And now for our discussion today, I suggest that we focus on uh, nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. I know it's not a topic, uh, which is why we're talking in English because uh, you know we hardly talk about nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament in France, even Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin basically forces himself to talk in English. And I try to bring uh, this uh, context more in the French uh, framework. And this is something that we should try and do because we need the French speaking country to talk about uh, non proliferation and disarmament the best way possible uh, to help uh, uh, spread not only francophonie, but francophonie non proliferation and disarmament because disarmament and non proliferation is something that is of utmost priority for the French government. So in 2018, uh, as you know, the doomsday clock, the symbolic uh, hour for the apocalypse developed by uh, the bulletin of the atomic scientists moved to two minutes before midnight. Uh, this is as close as possible to apocalypse as it was in 1953, when Cold War fears reached their highest levels. The immediate range nuclear force treaty, the INF, is in serious jeopardy. North Korea nuclear weapon program has also made remarkable progress over the past years, increasing risk, not only for itself, but for its neighbors, and most recently, even further abroad. You all recall the panic-filled media story highlighting that the US mainland is no longer out of reach uh, of North Korea ballistic missiles. Looking back, though, positive milestone 
must, must also be recognized. They all highlight the willingness of the international community to change and improve this critical security situation. The GCPOA, which is called the Iran deal, is one of them. Such multilateral agreements can serve as model. When we say can serve as model, some people say, why? I mean, each case is different, and each case is, uh, has its own symbolism. But we can come to that later. But that could also be applied to resolve the North Korean crisis, I guess. Today, it seems that the road ahead is full of obstacles. But I also know we have many friends to support us. France is surely, and as I mentioned, among them, firmly committed to pushing forward an end to nuclear tests. And I'll come to that point. France is committed, France has shown and then probably gone further than any other country among the nuclear weapon, the non-nuclear weapon countries under NPT, but probably they have to do a little bit more marketing in what they did uh, towards disarmament, and that's something that we can bring in the discussion. But let me dwell shortly on the context. Uh, France has signed the CTBT, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, on the 24th September 1996 and ratify it a year and a half later in April 98. With 25 certified stations, when I say certified station, I will talk about the international monitoring system. It's a system of stations, three, over 300 of them, and then France hosts 21 of them. When we say certify, it means that those stations meet the standard, the technical specification of the international monitoring system station. So those stations are sending data to the International Data Center in Vienna. This country has been steadfast proponent of the CTBT, both technically and politically. Technically, for completing its IMS, its International Monitoring System portion of the, the system, and also uh, politically by uh, keeping the CTBT higher up in its agenda. So an alumni of yours, uh, President Macron, recently highlighted that one of, the fr of France's priority Defense is the entry into force of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. As you know, France has reduced its airborne nuclear component by one third and has irreversibly dis dismantled its fissile material production facilities for nuclear weapon and nuclear test sites. It is the only country among the nuclear weapon states to have done so. The strong commitment by France to promote and universalize, and universalize the CTBT should be highlighted and commended. Certainly not well reflected in what we hear and then what we see, especially when we talk today about the Weapon Ban Treaty and France's position. I think France's position on the Weapon Ban Treaty seems to shadow what France has done to progress in disarmament, and that's something that we can talk about as well. So now, what is a CTBT? The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, for those who are not quite familiar with the treaty, it's a treaty that which purpose is to permanently ban all nuclear test explosion by anyone, anywhere, and in any environment. To achieve this, the treaty offers a global verification regime, making sure that no violation of the treaty goes undetected. And what is this verification regime? It's international monitoring system. Uh, this is a system of station and monitoring facilities across the globe. The international data center that basically collects, archive, distribute, analyze, and process data from the international monitoring system, and the on-site inspection component, which is the component that kicks in after entry into force, meaning if we do a detection, but if we have to verify on site that a country or in a position something has happened, we send inspectors. But unlike the International Atomic Energy Agency, we don't have inspectors that are permanent in the CTBT. We call them surrogate inspectors. So any of you can be trained as a surrogate inspector. You do your work, but we can call upon your expertise to come in when a situation arises where we need that uh, to help do an inspection in one country. So the, before the CTBT was concluded in 1996, some countries believed that their national security could only be secured through continuous development and build-up of nuclear weapons. This led to over 2,000 tests conducted by a handful of states in the 21st century. 2,000. 
2,000. There are about 500 that were done in Kazakhstan. And then we can come to that later. So since the treaty was concluded, there have been just 11 nuclear tests, and only seven of which were in the 21st century. And as you know, the DPRK is one of the country, the only one that is doing tests in this 21st century. One can argue that, but so what? If the treaty is there, and then you claim uh, you know, proudly that the treaty has an impact, why is North Korea doing tests? But the question we should ask, if this treaty wasn't negotiated, and if the framework, the verification regime wasn't in place, the international monitoring system, the international data center, and the buildup of the on-site inspection, what the world will look like? That's a question we should ask ourselves. If the CTBT didn't exist, how the world will look like today? Uh, certainly, we will probably have more countries doing tests because that was the period of the harm race, the Cold War, and then God knows what would happen today. So, whilst the CTBT has not yet entered into force, it constitutes a foundation alongside the non-proliferation treaty of the multilateral non-proliferation regime. And I say this, and I repeat it, because often people forget it. And you will recall, you probably saw some uh, high-level meetings recently in the United Nations context, and in many other frameworks as well, where people hardly, uh, while talking about verification, confidence-building measure, non-proliferation, disarmament, somehow omit to mention the Comprehensive Test Plan Treaty. And this is impossible. There is no way we can talk about those four aspects in arms control, non-proliferation, verification, and confidence building measure and forget for a second the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Is it part and parcel of the overall framework? And this is important. So it is important because the CTBT faces a crisis of relevance. A crisis of relevance because for the past 20 years, we've been going on awaiting its entry into force and somehow being satisfied by an international monitoring system and an international data center that perform at their best. And then we become a victim of our success because people say, if the IMS is functioning, the IDC is perfect, why do you need the entry into force of the treaty? To a point where we miss talking about it. We miss keeping the treaty relevant. But until this treaty is in force, until this treaty is legally binding, we cannot be sure that we will not go back to an arms race. And this is why nowhere we should omit to mention the CTBT and its relevance to international peace and stability, to the security of this planet, to conducting and contributing to non-proliferation, disarmament, arms control, confidence building measure, verification, you name it. Our verification system, the international monitoring system, is what Secretary Kerry has called one of the greatest accomplishments of the modern world. And this is what I believe in. And I invite you all to come to Vienna to see what we've done, to see the infrastructure, to see how we contribute to your daily life, to your daily security, by making sure that no nuclear test explosion goes undetected. So we can always and always <laughs> refer to something that is key to arms control and then we can leave no space for people forgetting that this treaty is important for international peace and security. So our organization, the Preparatory Commission in Vienna, it's not a group of 10 people or half a dozen people sitting and then working on the legal framework of a treaty. We have over 300 staff from 90 different nationalities who are working tirelessly monitoring this planet day in and day out, and then making sure that no nuclear test explosion goes undetected. And this is the preparatory commission that you know. Preparatory commission just on the word, just on the terminology, because there's nothing preparatory in this organization, because it functions. The organization works for a treaty which entry into force is pending. And this is why this notion of preparatory still comes in and kicks in and then put us in a, dif in a difficult situation and then bring that, what I call, a crisis of relevance that we're living in. And then we should fight that. We should fight that because people should know the importance of this treaty and how it can and it should contribute to international peace and stability. So what is the status? You have 183 countries that have signed this treaty. Basically, more than 90, 95% of the world population that is saying no to nuclear testing. 
And then 166 that have ratified, those are the people who are saying never to nuclear testing. So we want the entire planet to say never to nuclear testing by bringing this treaty legally binding and in force. And this is what the preparatory commission in Vienna is working for, putting the technical means and the political means in place ready for the entry into force of the treaty. And we're working tirelessly for the past 20 years to bring this to reality. There are only eight countries. When I say only eight, it's eight, but eight by too many. Eight countries with ratification is pending for the entry into force of the treaty. Five that have signed the treaty and pending ratification. You have the United States and China. You have Israel, Egypt, and Iran. Those are the five countries that have signed this treaty and the ratification is pending. And you have three others who have even not considered its ratification. It's India, Pakistan, and North Korea. And I guess you will agree with me, in this 21st century, no one wants to associate in a group where it is with a country that conducts nuclear test explosion. And to that effect, Pakistan has considered observership to the treaty. Pakistan is an observer to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and then we're hoping that this opens ways and light towards Pakistan considering its signature and ratification at some stage. So we're working tirelessly with those countries. I mean, you probably hear a lot that U.S. doesn't believe in the CTBT. That's not actually true, because U.S. is the biggest contributor as a country to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, outside Europe indeed, because Europe, the whole of Europe, the 28 countries represent 40% of its budget. So U.S. does pay for the treaty. So there is a domestic issue in the United States that needs to be solved there for them to consider the ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty when they're ready. But what, what we have to make sure, it's what we've achieved so far, bringing those 186 con 66 countries and the 183 countries strongly together to push for the remaining ones to end the marathon that we're starting, to finish what we started. And this is what we're doing at the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. So I've talked about the verification regime, which is now the international monitoring system is now over 90% completed, meaning in the 337 facility, there are 90% that are ready, and that makes today the treaty verifiable. With 92%, technically, we seem to be performing far better than even the, the envisaged 100%. But it doesn't mean that we don't need the 8 or 10% remaining. It just means that technologies have evolved, processing have evolved, and situations have evolved as well in a way where we seem to have covered the entire planet the best way possible to a point where no nuclear test explosion would go undetected at this point in time. But when I say no nuclear test explosion would go undetected, I shouldn't forget the national technical means of the countries that are party to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Because we have the international monitoring system, but we have also countries like France, the United States, Russia, China, and many other countries who have their national technical means to do nuclear test monitoring. So if you combine those with the international monitoring system, it is unlikely that any nuclear test detection, uh, in, a, in a nuclear test explosion will go undetected. So this is the situation of the treaty. So we can say with absolute confidence that it's very hard to see any nuclear test explosion today by a country even if he doesn't announce it, that will go undetected. So there's another aspect of the data that we collect for the international monitoring system. Our contribution to civil and scientific application, tsunami warning, climate change, global warming, sea temperature, environmental issues. I'll just use one example to give you an idea of what the CTBT uh, technology can offer. Fukushima in 2011. The Fukushima accident happened. It's the international monitoring system that the earthquake, the tsunami that was subsequent to the earthquake were detected by our monitoring facility, seismic and hydroacoustic. And at some point, you recall, media were arguing whether the nuclear power plant has exploded. And it took our infrasound technology, France is, uh, does have the expertise in this, together with Germany, to give the indication that the nuclear power plant had indeed exploded. But on top of that, the radionuclear technology, 
how to follow the dispersion of radioisotopes that came from this nuclear power plant around the planet. So this is our radionuclear system that basically it's a set of stations that are around the globe sucking the hair and then giving you an indication of what type of isotope are floating. And within two to three weeks, we prove that the isotopes are gone around the globe already and even move from the northern hemisphere to the southern one. And this is what we contribute to things that are beyond nuclear test explosion. And then we do much more. And that could come through the discussion if you have questions and things that you know. Finally, upon request to the Argentinian government, you recall the submarine that went missing a couple of months ago. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, its international monitoring system, contributed a lot by providing data to the Argentinian government and also to face media requests with regard to how the CTBT could help find this submarine. What happened, we did give an indication of the last signal received from the submarine. I mean, the rest is not only speculation, but it's a mix of using the technology and the information, the technical specification that we give to the reality in place. But as you know, an expert in submarine can tell you it's not easy as the submarine is basically sinking to face the pressure of the water and then it can change in shape and then make it hard to be detected. And those are things that are beyond our call. What we only do is to give an indication of the last position of the signal and then uh, people take it from there. We've done our best uh, to respond to the Argentinian request and then we were indeed uh, congratulated by the government of Argentina and by media despite the speculation and the perception that you probably heard here and there. But I mean, this is what we can do to show that beyond nuclear test explosion, our technology can be useful in many other means. And we did the same for the image, I mean, the Malaysian plane that disappeared. And then I think one of my staff were interviewed by CNN to that effect. It was all about giving the position of the last signal head uh, that, is close to the, uh, that was close to the position of the plane. So now, I've talked about the verification system, talked about what we did and what we can do. Now let me talk about how engaging people to get this treaty into force. And Benjamin mentioned engaging the youth. In the, engaging the youth is basically you, and because you can make a difference. By talking to you today, what I expect from you it's not only to know about the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, but to voice your position with, that, with regard to this treaty and know that the overall international multilateral diplomacy is in crisis. If we cannot face the reality of the treaty that we adhere to, if we cannot meet our obligation with regard to international framework that were agreed upon the majority of the world, where is the world going? If we don't believe in treaties anymore, we don't believe in ourselves. We don't believe in diplomacy. We don't believe in Sciences Po. Because you guys are coming from around the world to meet here, to share experience, to go back to your countries so that opportunity is given to you to negotiate, to talk, because you've known each other here and you know you can solve global issues together because you've shared a lot. And this is what we have to do. And this is why two years ago I engaged young people to try and help us to promote the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And it's some of those young people who are writing, writing a lot. In, I mean, they write a lot of editorials, op-ed, uh, voicing their concern with regard to how they see the future of their planet and how they want to see this world going. And this is what we need from you. You are the future, not the future, you are the leaders of today. Because I'm sure some of you, I see some of them probably tweeting, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Facebook is not my generation. I'm trying to catch up. But I mean, you guys are so tied up with social media that there's a lot more that you can do to change this world. And that's why we call upon you. We have to engage you. But at the same time, we have to bridge the gap between the generation that I know in the negotiation and your generation that is ready to prepare a better world, not only for you, but for your younger people. So let me conclude by saying that the problem we are facing today cannot be solved unilaterally. They also cannot be solved through military action. Multilateral diplomacy is key, and that's why you are key, and that's why you are at Science Po. 
You came to Science Po because you believe in multilateral diplomacy, because you want to change the world. If you don't want to change the world, you don't come at Science Po. You will remain in your country and probably grow potatoes. But if you came here, it's because you know that you can make a difference. And that's why it's so good to talk to people like yourself. This also gives me confidence that the new nuclear security architecture will be more inclusive and equitable. It is such architecture that will, through persistent and committed cooperation efforts, finally lead to the entry into force of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. To quote Einstein, peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding, and you're coming here to learn to understand each other. And the more we understand the challenges and opportunity in front of us today, the better we can advance. And I look forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zerbo. Uh, Mesdames et Messieurs, vous voilà prévenu des défis uh, qui vous attendent uh, for, the, for the next hour, at least. Uh, at the, for, for the moment, we will open uh, the beginning of the, our discussion with, uh, with Professor Pedopidas first, and then I will add some, some, some question, uh, because you, 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 you raised many challenges and many issues. We will try to, 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 to tackle many of them. Uh, the, 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 the plus possible. Je vais commencer avec Benoît. Euh, pour une dizaine de minutes. OK, merci. Merci, merci Benjamin. Uh, merci, Dr. Zerbo. So, thank you both. Uh, thank you, Benjamin, for uh, organizing this. And, and thank you, Dr. Zerbo. And on behalf of SIA, I'm, I'm one of the three uh, scientific advisors of the Masters in International Security. And so, it, we're really happy for our students, on top of for ourselves, to have you here today. So, basically, my, my remarks will be divided in three parts. One is just an observation, because you, your comments were very future-oriented, and so I'm taking advantage of an audience of students uh, to set the stage of like, what is it to invoke the next generation? What is it that we're passing upon them? So that's gonna be my, my first part. Then the second thing will be invitations for you uh, to do a few things, or to learn a few things, or to open your minds to a few things. And I'll finish with two questions for you, sir. Um, so let's get there. And that actually reminds me of the first time we met, which is the summer in Kazakhstan for uh, the Pugwash conferences, and everyone was invoking the next generation. But it was, th that's the thing that really got me, because I realized, like, wait, invoking future generations without empowering them is nothing more than transferring responsibility for a course of action already taken and possibly passing less freedom for action and margin of action than we do have. So then the question is, how do we actually empower you? Not just say, hey guys, it's up to you, deal with it now. So if, since we're all kind of trying to address that, um, I wanted to make like an invitation in, in three parts. In first say, empowerment is knowledge. That's why people like me become academics, you see. Um, and so empowerment essentially is first and foremost enlarging the scope of what you know about the nuclear past. And that's really a, a starting point that we too often forget. Nuclear secrecy is still there. And we are thinking about lessons from the past based on a very, very limited uh, image of what the past is about. And so that's one of the goals of my uh, chair of excellence here, to go beyond that and to offer primary sources documentation and conceptual tools to ask new questions to this nuclear past and the lessons learned from it. So that's the first, the first kind of invitation. The second one, and that speaks to your comment that it's hard to have a French-speaking audience talk about nuclear issues. The, the second uh, element is really thinking about the responsibility of analysts. And by analysts, I mean us all, and you too, if you choose to become analysts uh, as writers or people who speak about those issues to your friends and family. Because uh, based on a research published last year, we documented that 
basically due to the tradition of strategic studies and a few other elements, um, most of the scholarship on this issue is written as though the analysts were accountable to the managers of the existing nuclear order. And so there is a shift to operate to say we analysts are possibly, but maybe not, accountable to those people, but we should be accountable to a much broader set of people, including the coming generations, including the citizens of a future in the making. And if you're interested in how to operationalize that type of shift, uh, come to me. There is a published piece here. And there we get to basically the institutional foundation, which is uh, precisely, I'm proud to say that this chair of excellence is the first uh, program on the nuclear phenomenon in France, which basically says we need independent research that's radically independent from the priorities and preferences of the French establishment and industry. Therefore, we've refused funding from any of those sources. Not that we dislike them, but that we think most people already take this money. So there is space for independent research. And so we are basically supported by the Chair of Excellence, uh, EU funding through uh, a European Research Council grant. So the, the goal here is to precisely open up the set of questions that we are thinking about. And one of them is precisely how is it that we can think of a future that's not just a continuation or slight improvement upon uh, the past. And so here, the question that directly uh, kind of interests you is there is a question that we don't yet know the answer to, which is, is there such a thing as a post-testing generation? You know, Dr. Zerbo said after, basically in the 21st century, only North Korea is testing. So what that means is, in the same way we thought of a nuclear generation for those who became adults in the 50s and 60s, because testing, mostly if they were you know, in the US, the UK, and the Soviet Union, testing in preparation for some sort of nuclear disaster was part of their daily life and their upbringing for you possibly, testing has become some sort of a virtuality that happens in the distance. So then one of the research questions that we're trying to address is precisely, is there such a thing as a post-testing generation? And that's not just a scholarly question. The reason why it matters is because most of the policy discussion is, I would claim, uh, premised on three independent assumptions about you. The first is that we're really sorry that you've forgotten so much about the danger. And that's really something we need to do something about. So you're forgetful. At the same time, you're indifferent. There's a lot of talk about, oh, it's so bad, they really don't care. And the third assumption is, since you're not protesting in the street the way people were in the 80s, that means that you tacitly approve. And I'm like, wait, you cannot be both forgetful and indifferent and supportive. If first, this combination of assumptions doesn't make any sense. So what we started to do is precisely a large scale polling of EU citizens under the age of 30 to understand what their understanding of the nuclear phenomenon is, what their references are, what exactly is it that they know, what is it that they want, and what is it that they're willing to give, and like, uh, in which way are they willing to commit themselves to some sort of thinking or action. And the first finding, it's a preliminary finding, but it's, it's published as a, an EU non-proliferation paper that uh, Benjamin is taking care of, um, is precisely not a sense of support of existing policies, but an in-depth sense of powerlessness. And so that really makes uh, Dr. Zerbo's remarks even more relevant. We need to undo this sense of powerlessness. We need to really empower you. That was kind of my second invitation to really think uh, of yourself as a generation, and if so, what, what's, what's, you know, what do you want this generation to be remembered for? Um, and so now, now I come to my two questions for you. The first one is just more, it's just more of a surprise. Um, so you said, if I heard you correctly, until the treaty is legally, is legally binding, we cannot be sure we will not go back to an arms race. So does that mean 
that in your interpretation, we're not in one yet. So that, that's basically the first question. And the, and the second question is basically, is, is really the one that you probably anticipated, is, is the one about how would you imagine changes or conditions so that the entry into force of the treaty would become likely? And, and if your answer to that question is, I don't see any in the foreseeable future, then is it not possible to decouple the treaty from the successes of the monitoring system and the international data center? And, or, and like, you know, if, if you don't think that's a good idea, why not? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benoit, for, for these first comments. Uh, I also have three questions for you, Dr. Zerbo. Uh, first, as, let's say, a preliminary remark, uh, uh, I will uh, address you, Benoit, just a second. I can see, of course, the rationale of promoting your chair of excellency here in Science Sports is perfectly fair, but I think it is not the only place in France to address nuclear uh, uh, issues independently. And as far as I am concerned, uh, my dear friend, I do at the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique. So thank you for that. And a second, uh, the, my three questions, comments, and, and comments, and, th and questions for you, Dr. Zerbo, are, are the following. I think that the US uh, nuclear uh, posture review recently released uh, deserves here a special comment, because uh, the full report of the NPR mentions, as we all know, the CTBT uh, at least two times, but it's uh, good news for no one, unfortunately. And I'd like to quote the whole paragraph, because uh, words are, are really counting here. They say, the Pentagon writes the, the, the following sentence. Although the United States will not seek Senate ratification of the CTBT, it will continue to support the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization Preparatory Committee, as well as the related International Monitoring System and the International Data Center, which detect nuclear tests and monitor seismic activity. And here it follows, the United States will not resume nuclear explosive testing unless, unless necessary to ensure the safety and effectiveness of the US nuclear arsenal, and calls on all states possessing nuclear weapons to declare or maintain a moratorium on nuclear testing." End quote. And I personally do not see the rationale for resuming nuclear testing in the US since no new warhead is about to be designed according to the uh, latest version of the NPR. But for the first time since the treaty is open for signature, one nuclear posture review mentions the theoretical possibility for resuming tests. Would you say, Dr. Zabou, it is a setback? It can be considered as such. And if it is so, do we have to wait and to see what a future administration will do? Or is there something that can be done in the meantime? And if something can be done, what would be the operating levers in the foreseeable future? So that's my first question, a very detailed one, very precise one. The second one is about nuclear testing by the DPRK. Uh, it's my, my second uh, uh, preferred topic because as an observer, uh, the latest nuclear tests by Pyongyang, as you know, 3 September 2017, be it thermal nuclear test or boosted device test, 
maybe you can have uh, something uh, to say about it, was at the same time a huge failure for the global non-proliferation regime and a big success for the uh, international monitoring system of your organization. So it seems that, technically speaking, the system has given at least three tangible signs of effectiveness and, 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 and usefulness in January and September 2016, thanks to the DPRK, if I may, and in September 2017. But as you said, the verification system is second to none, but political will still have to be captured. But precisely, political will as to nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament initiatives in general is what lacks most by now. And this leads me to my third point, which is very brief. We've all had in mind uh, for years that completing the verification system would play the cause of the treaty in many remaining states, in particular the eight ones remaining states, particularly in the US, of course, where the debate under the Bush administration than in the Obama administration. Would you still think that this argument is correct? My understanding of our strategic times with new strategic competitors, the emerging of China on the strategic uh, stage, uh, is the following. No real progress will be made on the multilateral front for the time being and for the foreseeable future. So maybe should we rather focus our attention on securing what can be secured for the time being? I could be wrong, of course, I'm, you know, I'm challenging you. Do you realistically think that a more ambitious goal can be set up on the, the uh, nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament realm? And if you do so, what could it be? Okay. So this is for uh, launching our discussion. And, and just af af afterwards, I mean, in, in the same movement, we can open the floor uh, to, to the participants. Thank you very much. <coughs> Please, the floor is yours. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Benjamin. Uh, thank you, Benoit, for uh, uh, your comments. Uh, Benjamin, uh, no, Benoit, I'll start with uh, your word about uh, uh, believing in youth and uh, but the lack of uh, employment. I can't agree more with you because uh, one thing is to give them a voice, but we have to prepare them to have the voice that is necessary to move things forward. Because the reason why we believe in youth is because they think and speak out of the box. Uh, they're not stereotyped and then confined to a way of talking and saying, I can't do this. Uh, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, at uh, the 18th January Security Council meeting on uh, uh, disarmament. The first tweet that I saw was uh, one of the CTBT youth group members basically tagging the Secretary General of the United Nations and asking why he did not mention the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty while talking about non-proliferation, arms control, confidence building measure and verification. I wish this could be a forum of discussion as well, Twitter, where uh, that youth group member will have an answer. But what I respect is that what we give at the CTBT to youth, we prepare them to understand not only the fact that nu banning nuclear tests is important, how they can do it, and give them the tools to see what the IMS is, what the IDC is, what the verification regime is, and how it fits with the treaty. And how do we do that? How do we empower them? We allow them to come not only for internship, but we give them a platform during our science and technology a series of conferences for them to talk. We do media newsroom uh, to allow them to know how to interact with media, to write articles and so forth so that they just don't go wild and then start talking about issues that are difficult 
and so sensitive and not being facing uh, a situation where people will say they don't know what they talk about. If you look at the platform that we've offered to CTBT, Youth for CTBT, there isn't a single youth group member that I've seen writing something, an article, that didn't make sense. So it means that we do give them the power for their action. And I believe in that. But you, as a professor at Sciences Po, this is what you do, is to give the tool to your student to face the world, to face the reality of the moment. But having specific topic, you're not just giving a course in general. You're focusing on international relations because you want them first to understand each other, to understand the world, and then to see how best they can face the reality of the world and deal with sensitive topic. So I can't agree more with you. So you talk about them being the post generation of testing and uh, basically putting them to face uh, the reality of the world today. Is it because they don't understand what the use of nuclear weapon can be or has been? They don't understand what testing is, and therefore they're not geared to face the reality of the world today and deal with global issue. There I differ a little bit because giving them and empowering them is giving them the tool to visit Hiroshima, to touch what the use of nuclear weapon is, to visit Kazakhstan to see the effect of nuclear testing to talk to institutions like the CTBT and many other international organizations where they face the reality of talking to people who are dealing on a daily basis with those issues. And this is empowering them and basing them, sending them to the past, to understand the past better so that they can face the future. And that's what we're doing. And that's why you invite people like myself to come and exchange with them. I'm not a professor at Sciences Po, but just spending an hour with them give that opportunity to interact for them to understand what am I doing and what they aspire to do if they wish to work for an international organization like the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And this is where we make a difference. So now, coming to your question about uh, the treaty legally binding and the armed race, because you think that we are in armed race already, I think the situation could have been worse if we didn't have the international monitoring system. If we didn't have this platform where today we talk about the issue and then we make the leaders of this world to face their reality without what is happening, in telling them we're not there yet. We cannot be talking about the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in that crisis of relevance that I've mentioned and just be happy that we have an international monitoring system that works in international data center and then we probably don't need an on-site inspection. This isn't right. It's not right because if this was designed after years of years of negotiation, years of years of scientific research, I mean, the CTBT is the, and I want to say this, the treaty that has taken so long and so hard to be put in place to have the concept and design to have a verification regime to verify compliance to a treaty that is so important. And this has been done over years, decades, and decades to come to a treaty and then decades to have this treaty into force. So that's not an easy topic. So we cannot say today that we are in an arms race. I think the CTBT and the NPT framework have helped to contain, at least to reduce what could have been worse if we didn't have those treaties in place and those set of negotiations for so many decades. If the world was without the NPT today, without the CTBT, without the Chemical Weapon Convention, without a discussion on the Biological Weapon Convention, without the possible framework of the FMCT, a Fissile Material Cuff of Treaty, I mean, the world will be wild. Everyone will be doing what they want, and then we won't talk about arms race. We'll talk about, you know, being in the Far East like we used to see in, Mibu, in movies. So, but that's not the case. We have the CTBT, but we have to obey to those treaty, and that's what is key, and that's what is important. We cannot just negotiate treaty and not push them to their finalization. I see the CTBT as a marathon, okay? We're running, we're passing the baton. We've been passing the baton for more than 20 years. It's about time that we finish what we started. And to finish what we started, we not only in need of people like yourself. We are in need of those young people 
We have to empower them, and then we have to give them the voice they need to make a difference in the world. And therefore, I think the CTBT today has contributed to stabilize, to a certain extent, the world situation with regard to arms control. But it could be better, and it will be better, if the treaty was in force. If the treaty is not in force, we open the gates for a situation where somebody can say, oh yes, you know, I want to still leave that option where I can test. But if it's legally binding, it's over. It's over. The treaty is in force. There's an enforcement mechanism that is done through the executive council. There's no room for testing again. And that's why I was talking about the difference between no and never to nuclear mm -hmm. testing. A binding CTBT, legally binding CTBT makes nuclear test explosion never again. So this is why I use it. I'm not saying we're not in an arm race, but let's say the race could have been faster. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's where we are. So your other question was how to change the condition for the entry into force. Do I see any? I mean, if you lock me in a room and you ask me how I could get this treaty in force, you know, many, if you, when I talk to a school, uh, a student at school, they tell me, but sir, why don't you lock those eight entry, uh, countries in a room and then tell them to sign at the same time? That's the easiest way to do. Okay? But if you can't get them to sign, you have 90%, if we are in democracy, I thought democracy is the law of the majority. I wish the law of the majority could apply to the CTBT, but it's not that. We have a treaty, we have an annex two, a framework that basically dictates that those 44 countries' ratification is absolutely necessary for its entry into force. To be able to change the condition, we risk facing a situation where we won't have as many countries who would have signed and ratified the CTBT. It will send us maybe 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 years back. We are at the end of the marathon. We have eight countries away and five that have signed and which ratification is remaining. I don't think it's impossible to get this treaty in force. Why? History has shown, geopolitical conditions have shown that things can change quickly. Nobody knew that in the end we'll have an Iran deal, the GCPOA. Nobody knew that after a situation with the chemical weapon use in Syria that will have the chemical weapon convention signed by Syria and then a global, a global adherence to a chemical weapon convention and a unanimous condemnation of it. But what we don't need, we don't need a nuclear catastrophe before the CTBT can get into force. World has been used to dealing with crisis rather than preventing crisis. For once, I think we should prevent crisis by getting the CTBT into force. Because the CTBT can contribute to peace and stability. The CTBT will and has to contribute to the non-proliferation treaty. And the CTBT can serve, in the long run, the weapon ban treaty. We need a CTBT in force because it's the simplest step that we can take to advance disarmament, arms control, and non-proliferation. So your question led to decoupling verification from the treaty. Unfortunately, this is what, as executive secretary, I don't want to hear. Uh, if I was taking a shortcut, and if I was taking the easiest way out, I would say, okay, yes, maybe I want the organization to be fully fledged so that they call me instead of executive secretary, director general. But you don't have to think about yourself, okay? Why getting an organization that was meant to serve a treaty and then forget about the treaty and then say, I satisfy myself with the success story of the organization. I don't want that as executive secretary of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. What I want is this treaty in force and this strong organizational framework that serves the treaty and that verify compliance with the treaty. Because this is why it has been conceived and this is how it's been conceived to serve the international community. This was made hard to conceive so hard to conceive because the success in the end will make it one of the strongest ever decided agreement in multilateral diplomacy. And if we get the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in force, we'll be proud that the world would have achieved something that was never ever thought to have been a, to, could be, to possibly be a success. Some people tell me 
They say, Mr. Zerbo, you know, seeing and looking at the CTBT, it as if it was designed to never enter into force, as if it was designed to always be a preparatory commission with the success story of its verification system. I like and I commend the staff of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty for the work they do day in and day out to keep this treaty alive, to keep this monitoring system to the service of the international community. But I still think that we cannot dissociate and separate those two. It is important to keep them together because this is how they've been con uh, conceived. Issues of concern or perception with regard to the treaty are often domestic issues that can be dealt and should be dealt domestically. But in the end, institutions are strong enough to lead us to the success we need to get this treaty into force. And this is what I would hope that we can do. So now talking, uh, turning into Benjamin. Uh, you talk about the NPR. The good news is that I was officially briefed by the US mission on the day of the release of the NPR. And I went on to tweet on a Twitter where I said, happy to be brief and then hope that the moratorium on nuclear testing that the US is talking about preserves the possibility of the entering to force of the CTBT. I mean, anyone can read or understand what I said in this tweet the way they want. But at the end, if the US believes in the moratorium on nuclear testing and they support the organization, let's say that it's better than the rhetoric that we're hearing, meaning the situation could have been worse. So because I always see the glass half full, I'm hoping that we can fill the glass up by creating the condition where the trust and confidence will lead the US to see the glass differently, and then we can meet halfway. Asking me if I can sit and wait for another administration, uh, I won't try to play this lotto game because I'm not in the US domestic politics. And who knows, maybe there's, uh, it's the same administration. Who can judge that? Why should I sit and then say I'm happy, I will go under water or under the table and wait three years for a hypothetical uh, government or administration to come before I can talk about the CTBT? No. Regardless of the administration, we should believe in the institution. Institution of countries should be strong and beyond administrations. And we have to try and work with any administration, be it Republican or Democrat, in a way where we preserve what is important for the international community and get the CTBT in force. And this is our job. We should not judge administration by the way they are because this is domestic politics. We should focus on our work. Our work is to get the United States to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty one day when they're ready and they believe that it's time to do so. We work with any administration to do that job. And this is what our role is at the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And then we thank the US for continuing their support to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, their financial support, because it is important to move into getting the verification regime in place. So you talk about uh, when they say that they believe and then they will not resume testing unless. I don't want to go into judging or speculating about what people can say. My comment will be, it's like when people say, as long as nuclear weapon exists, we want to keep our deterrent. As we say, and as the French say, nous voulons garder notre système de dissuasion tant que les armes nucléaires existent. So all the nuclear weapon countries are basically putting themselves in that situation. So I can only see, but I will not comment on this. The only thing I can say is that through the CTBT, through the NPT, we can open way for a better world for a better future, not for ourselves, but for the future generation. DPRK, is it a thermonuclear test, isn't it? This is not part of our uh, technical ability at the CTBT. The only thing I can say is that this test was big time, much higher than any of the previous one, and that it's certainly not, uh, not only that it's not of the same magnitude, but it's given indication that we're in a different game at this point in time in North Korea. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Zerbo, for your answers. Uh, 
now we just, sorry just to, just a point of, of clarification on, since, since i was called upon uh by name so uh, i'm not interested in promoting that program uh based on the research i told you about i'm interested in independent research understood as not accepting the funding from players in the nuclear game, either advocates, activists, ministries of defense, or industry. And it is a fact that this program is the only program that refuses categorically funding for its research from any of those uh, uh, entities. That's not the only way to think about how to do research, and that's dramatically unusual in France. But nonetheless, that's the first and only program that does that, has an advisory board that's exclusively composed of scholars because of their contribution to knowledge, no former official of any kind for that reason only, and that has been recognized uh, for scholarly uh, advancement of knowledge. So that's what I meant, and I hope that's what I was understood as saying. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We will not open a discussion on the independence of research in France. Thank you. So now we have a debate with, uh, the, the, with the room. The floor is open and uh, please, uh, uh, we, we can take uh, a few questions and comments and, and then uh, uh, Dr. Zabo uh, will answer. Thank you very much. We have time. We have 50 minutes. Yes, please. Uh, just, just May you please introduce yourself uh, uh, clearly before asking your question. Thank you very much. May, may, maybe can can get a, a mic yeah, microphone. Mic somewhere. Um, that would help. Ah, that's good. Nice. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My name is Omar. I study international relations. I'm an exchange student from Morocco. And my question is, uh, do you think that if the US takes the initiative to recognize the North Korea as a nuclear state, instead of uh, referring to it as a rock state, may be one of the key aspects that may open the floor for uh, a plausible uh, uh, peace treaty between the US and North Korea. Thank you. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm Emilia and I work in uh, Oh, it's working. Uh, Fine. Um, so thank you for your presentation. I'm Emilia. I work um, in Master 2, and I'm working for Initiative for Nuclear Disarmament, a French NGO uh, works in, in, in Paris. And I, I'm, I'm wondering, um, in the way your organization works, in the way your organization conceives its mission, is nuclear test ban a process included in a larger nuclear ban or nuclear disarmament process, or do you conceive them as independent? Because, for instance, you, you say that France is committed to uh, CTBT, but not very much to the uh, recent nuclear, nuclear ban treaty signed uh, last July by the UN General Assembly. So do you conceive um, nuclear test ban as a step to nuclear disarmament? Thank you. Um. Hello, um, I'm Lisa. I'm a student in the first master's year in international security. Um, and uh, I wanted to thank you for your intervention. And I am really admiring your work, especially targeting the youth. And I was wondering, um, so I had three questions. Um, first, with regards to the current political dynamics, whether you think um, that the CTBTO is, um, so what your personal estimations are um, regarding the time frame that um, it's going to take for the CTBTO to be signed um, by all um, states and whether states like North Korea can actually be tamed or legally bound to it. Um, secondly, um, so the organization is currently is in a preparatory commission and whether there are mechanisms in place that are going to help the transfer to um, its actually establishment um, or whether it's an automatic um, process. 
And lastly, um, I want to ask you what the legacy of the previous secretaries of the organizations are, of the organization are. Thank you. Okay, we have a last one. Yes, please, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, William Mako. I actually teach here in the um, uh, International Development Program. Thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, the monitoring um, aspects of it I wasn't at all aware of. Um, and and I, I like the uh, distinction between the post and pre-testing uh, generation. Uh, growing up in the U.S., I remember underground testing, which was bad enough, and, and uh, I also remember atmospheric testing, which was just horrifying. Uh, so I, I mean, at an emotional level, I really want CTBT to work, but I do, th I do wonder, and I want to press you on your comments about nuclear deterrence and, and such, because I do think this is might be at the nub of the U.S. government issue with uh, with the treaty. Um, so I want to ask you two specific questions, and maybe press you on that a bit. The first would be whether you see a valid role for French, British, and U.S. nuclear weapons. And the second would be uh, what the probability of, would be of maintaining reliability of those weapons, o o of existing weapons, not new stuff, over the next 20 years without explosive testing. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, let me uh, start by the, the last one. Uh, since you talk about uh, reliability to maintain, uh, I mean, to maintain the reliability of the, the nuclear weapon without testing. You know, as somebody from uh, developing countries, uh, I often try to escape uh, this question, and then I'm going to tell you why. If we start talking about uh, the lab modeling that is done to simulate testing and the nuclear weapon countries to be in a position to develop or to maintain the stability of their arsenal without an explosive testing, we walk the fine line between the perception that there is modernization and the perception that we're just maintaining the arsenal. And this is what creates this divide between the nuclear weapon countries and the non-nuclear weapon countries today. So as somebody from a developing country, this is a line that I don't like walking. But having said this, if you consider modeling as a geophysicist or as a used to be scientist, you feed your model with experience. Okay, you run an, exper an experiment, not experiment, I'm talking about experiment, to feed your model. If you feed your model with experiment, in the long run, you won't have a set of tools in experimentation that will feed the model. It will take years before you find a situation where you're reaching a position where you're not sure of the safety and reliability of the weapon. But it is the hope, I guess, from the nuclear weapon countries and the rest of the world, that by that time where people leave in doing modeling to keep the reliability, that the Zabberman would have progressed as well to a point where people will reverse instead of continuing and needing testing to feed again model. So I'm being a little bit complex here, but I'm trying to run, it's like an equation where you go this direction and then there's a stability here and then people are trying to walk and then we try to compromise in a way. So this is trying to see it in a positive way because this is what I always do. But in the end, what led the developing countries to say, we don't want this modeling. They're putting the CTBT at jeopardy because they say, we're not allowing simulation for testing. But the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty doesn't include simulation. But when you say this, people tell you, no, 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 no. You can't say this. Countries should not do simulation. But we work in treaties. If you read the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, we talk about explosive testing. OK? So as such, the CTBT doesn't include those simulations. But it doesn't mean that in the long run, 
we shouldn't stop the simulation because we don't need them anymore because the Zabman would have made a progress in a way where people we would not need to keep the reliability of the stockpile. So a little bit more idealistic. But the reality is the following. People are telling me, but Mr. Zerbo, when I talk to young 10-years-old uh, uh, student, they tell me, but, but if you don't believe in your nuclear weapon and you're not sure about your reliability, why don't you dump them? Because we are in a world where we want to reduce them. So, but the world, as we know, is far more complex than this. So your question is that we have only those countries who are still keeping the reliability through modeling, and this is why we're not testing. But I don't want this to be a reason to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Can you imagine? If I come as a country and then I tell the rest of the world, you know, you know, I can ratify the CTBT because I don't need testing anyway. I don't need testing because I can do the models through computer. Mm -hmm. I raise the concern of those countries that you're not respecting their will for disarmament and their will for progress. So even this is what you're doing, don't mix the context of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and the situation of the reliability of your stockpile stewardship. And this is what creates problem between the nuclear weapon countries and the non-nuclear weapon countries. And this is why, uh, to come back to what I say, I often don't get into this debate because it's a difficult line and a fine line to run. I just hope that even if the reliability of the stockpile of those countries is to preserve it until nuclear weapon exists, that we have to prepare our world for a time where nuclear weapon don't exist. And that leads me to one of the questions about the nuclear ban treaty and how the CTBT fits into it. This is another complex question as well, because often when I talk about the, ban, the weapon ban treaty, people say, oh, he doesn't believe in nuclear ban, he doesn't believe in the world free of nuclear weapon. But let's be practical or pragmatic for a moment. If I ask you a question, can you today or who believe that we can all of a sudden get rid of the nuclear weapon in this world, just like that, by a treaty? So it was adopted. They won the, the Nobel Peace Prize. So what next? What next is we need the CTBT. It is next, but it was before. Because Dr. Blix, the former director general of the IEA, says the CTBT is the simplest step that one can take to advance arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation. Why? We often say it's the lowest hanging fruit. It's a fruit that is easy to grab. We are at the end of the marathon. If we were running a race, the weapon ban treaty is far behind and the CTBT is close to the end of the line. Let's finish the line with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and then let's get the baton from those who are beyond so that we can move and then reach a nuclear weapon free world. I'm for a nuclear weapon free world. You all are for a nuclear weapon free world. But let's try and do what is practical today. Let's try and achieve in a pragmatic way what we can achieve today. And this is why I say that we need the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in force. We need the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty legally binding to prepare our world free from nuclear weapon. And uh, this was my point to that question. So there was another question about, uh, I'm going backwards, you know, from back to the end, about the legacy of my, the previous executive secretary. You know, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and its preparatory commission uh, it's now 22 years. There were two executive secretaries before me, and it's an organization that is in the build-up, and each one comes to play its role at a particular time of the history of the organization. My predecessors have done a lot in getting started with the build-up of the station, in securing a number of signature and ratification. I'm coming at the level of maturity of the organization that deserve a time where we keep its relevance, and this is what I'm doing, and that's why I'm touring the world and then making sure that I talk to people like yourself, and then we bring initiative, not like only the science and technology series of workshops that we have to keep the relevance of the technology we use, but also the youth group and the group of eminent person to voice their concern with regard to the entry into force of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. So, it's like layers. 
One comes, he does his job, another one comes, and then I come on top, and somebody will come after me and then has his own fair share of the organization until such time where we get it in force. But you'll probably love this. The organization is the only place where you, you work to lose your job. Do you know why? Because if the treaty is to enter into force today, I lose my job. So I'm working to lose my job. Isn't it interesting? I don't, find, I don't think you guys want to do that, but this is what we do at the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. My two predecessors have worked hard to lose their job, and I'm working to try and lose my job the soonest. So if you want to lose my job, help me to get this treaty into force, and then I'll go and grow potatoes in Burkina Faso. So uh, the time frame for entry into force, I wish yesterday, uh, when people talk about entry into force, it's long due. Look, mm, we never know when, but we just hope soon. And this is what I often say. With your help, I think we will get it sooner. And this is why it's important to talk to people like yourself, to get you on board to help us finish that marathon and finish what we started. So uh, the question on the US taking initiative to accept that DPRK is a nuclear state, and uh, instead of uh, any other rhetoric, uh, to help ease the tension. You see, I'm not even sure that we should put ourselves in a situation where we have to accept anything. There's something that we just see, and we have to face it. There's no comment to make there. But by officially taking DPRK as a nuclear weapon state, we jeopardize the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And that's one of the reasons why not only the US, the international community cannot accept a status of a new nuclear weapon countries in the NPT framework. Under the NPT, even if unofficially we know that there are further countries, we say there are five countries under the NPT that are nuclear weapon states. The United States, China, Russia, UK, and France. So, you can name others, but under the NPT, those are the ones. So for the NPT to change, they would have to agree that those other countries that you hear about are officially nuclear weapons, and that hasn't been done. So it's difficult if you don't acknowledge that those are, that you acknowledge that the DPRK is, because you put the NPT in jeopardy. And I think that's one of the reasons why this is not an accepted status. However, what I think and what I still believe is that we should put ourselves in a situation by all means that we dialogue with the DPRK. Dialogue doesn't mean it's different from negotiation. You have to be able to talk to somebody before you negotiate. You have to be able to look somebody in your eyes to sit around the table with that person. So you have to open a way to sit around the table with somebody before you can even dream that you can negotiate something tangible with that person. And we're not there yet. And this is what we probably have to do. First, find a way to sit, because there's no other options. Many experts in the world, Zig Heke from Stanford, Bill Perry, former Secretary of uh, Defense of the United States, they've all voiced their concern without any other means uh, to deal with the Korean Peninsula issue than multilateral diplomacy. And when we talk about multilateral diplomacy, we talk about you guys. You guys can also propose a way to deal with the DPRK, because this is your job. You can do an essay in those things. We need that. We need people like yourself to talk about it, to share what you heard and what you learn and what you see about this global world so that you can change this world. You can change and then inject ideas in the leaders of the world's mind so that they believe that you're there to push them behind and then get this thing solved. This is what we believe in and this is what you guys, we want you guys to do. I think that covers uh, the set of questions that I receive. I don't know if I forget any. Uh, please remind me. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, um, I'm Ossiane Tranchet. Uh, I work at the Atomic Energy Commission. Um, let's be optimistic and say that the CTBT go in force. Um, and imagining, like, if one country who ratified the CTBT goes and does a nuclear test, uh, what would be the reaction reaction of the CTBTO and 
what could be the sanctions uh, against this country. Uh, Raymond Wang, Monterey Institute, um, Center for Non-Proficient Studies. Um, I have actually have two questions. Uh, so first, I know that you vi recently visited China uh, to commemorate the uh, certification of the IMS facilities. Um, so as you mentioned earlier, China has signed but not ratified the CTPT. Um, and I was wondering if during your conversation with, the, with Chinese officials, they mentioned anything about the main hurdles, whether be it domestic or, or, or international, towards Chinese ratification. And then the other question I have uh, deals with the definition of the nuclear explosion within the CTBT. So as you mentioned before, uh, computer simulated testing is not covered under the CTBT. Uh, neither is subcritical testing. Um, However, during the negotiation for the ban treaty, there's been, there, ha there was a concerted effort by, certain, by a certain group of states to include uh, subcritical and computer simulated testing uh, mm -hmm. in, into the core prohibitions of the ban treaty. Um, so do you, well, first of all, what do you think of this, this, this effort? I mean, it didn't make it into the final version, but uh, what, what do you think of this effort? And also, do you think this, dissatisfaction with or these perceived loopholes within the CTBT uh, will prove to be problematic for it in the future. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have another one? No? Okay then. Okay. A perceived loopholes in the CTBT I don't think I, I would want to buy that because each negotiation has a time, okay? If the CTBT were to be negotiated today, it would have, it would have had a different connotation, probably including computer simulation, but it was negotiated and agreed upon 20 years ago. Today, it would be a different ball game. So does it mean that we should consider the CTBT as having loophole and then take a new treaty like the BAM Treaty to say that completes the CTBT and then forget where we're trying to get at the end of the marathon and then start a new ball game where we might not even get to, the, to where we are today. What we're trying to do is to preserve what we've achieved and try to move on. We don't want to step back. I'm not saying the BAM Treaty gets the CTBT back, but the BAM Treaty in its concept, and then you said that some aspect didn't get to the final draft, but the aspect didn't get to the final draft because of the difficulty in having a document that was solid. The BAM Treaty was negotiated in a couple of, I would say, months or years, but the CTBT took years, decades of scientific research, anything and putting people together before it was adhered to and then open for signature. The BAM Treaty is probably what we all aspire in future, to get our world free from nuclear weapon. But the CTBT is a step towards that. The discussion whether they should include aspects of the CTBT in the BAM Treaty or not, it's something that we didn't get involved because we're not part of the negotiation of the BAM Treaty. Having said this, what I often say, anything that can contribute to get the CTBT in force, to prepare for this world free of nuclear weapon, is something that we buy into, and something that we will want to buy into. But practically, we're closer to the entry into force of the CTBT than the implementation of a weapon ban treaty. And that's a reality, it's a fact that we can all see. I think we can uh, get the proponent of the BAM Treaty uh, after its adoption and where we are uh, to consider probably advocating for the CTBT entry into force as an element to prepare for the next NPT review conference because the CTBT is an element of consensus or near consensus that we can bank on. Rather than bringing a big divide that will risk as a whole 
the NPT, or any future arms control and non-proliferation agreement. And this is what I believe in. And once again, I'm not saying, and all of us here believe in the world free of nuclear weapons, and we want to achieve that. But let's see what practical move we have to get there. And I think the CTBT is one of the practical and the simplest move that we can take right now. And I know you're from Monterey. I'm working a lot with the Monterey Institute, and then I saw you in California. Uh, you guys do simulation. We talk about many things. And uh, I want to commend the Monterey Institute for the effort of its students and members of the youth group uh, to support all research aspect to getting the CTBT to keep its relevance and then how we can move forward. But I do know that you guys have a strong debate there with regard to the BAM Treaty, the CTBT, and other aspects, including the NPT. You do the simulation. I've been part of one. And I want you guys to have this and keep this in your mind that, you know, until we get the CTBT in force, we won't have the framework of confidence that is necessary to progress in arms control and non-proliferation. We'll still have things that you call loopholes here, loopholes there, and that will make life difficult for us. Uh, CTBT, EIF, and sanction, uh, that was a question there. Um, I mentioned the possible executive council after the entry into force of the CTBT. Meaning, if the CTBT is in force, we become like OPCW with our own executive council that decides basically on what to do after a violation of the treaty. And the example of the CTBT and your question has been the difficulty that OPCW, I talked to the Director General, they face during the Syria negotiation. You had the Executive Council of OPCW that was deciding, and then you had the UN Security Council that was kicking in. And then you have a movement from the UN Security Council to pursue the issue in Syria, and then you had OPCW, and then how to dovetail those efforts was one of the difficulties. So there is a lot more to do in terms of multilateral diplomacy between an Executive Council of an international organization that deals with the violation of the treaty that they refer to, and the Security Council of the UN. And don't forget, when we talk about Security Council, the Security Council has the representation of many, but you know as well more than many of us that the Security Council has been and remained an issue because many countries said that they need more participating voice at the Security Council. So that's a discussion that will come and on and on again, and that probably goes beyond what an international organization that is independent, because that's it. Although we've seen as an affiliated organization to the UN, although I have a UN passport, I don't report to the Secretary General, even if he's a depository of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. I report to the 183 states that govern the organization, and that's our job. And it's the same for the OPCW, it's the same for IEA, because those international organizations, the heads report to the state that govern the body that uh, the organization that they run. So the Executive Council is supposed to be independent, but its independence can also go and lead to linkages between the organization and the Security Council to try and secure an overall framework where the international community buys in. Sanction, I don't know. That's to be discussed at the Executive Council. The example of Syria is probably one that is closest to your question that we can look into. So those were the question. I don't think I missed any. No, no. Okay. Can, can I say something? Well, yeah. yeah, so something quick. Uh, since we commended the Monterey Institute, and we also we all actually want you to get engaged and start writing about things, I just wanted to point to a special issue of the Non-Proliferation Review on the 20th anniversary of uh, the CTBT, precisely, where you will find several of the issues we've addressed and also the issue of the connection between testing and reliability assessment. Mm. So that, that would be relevant to our discussion if you want to read further. And the other thing, if you want to read further and bug me, is that uh, basically with my postdoc, Gray Anderson, we managed to get access to the personal archives of Robert Purifoy, who was a safety engineer at Sandia National Laboratory from the 50s to his retirement in 1991. In his personal paper, uh, there are a lot of interesting discussions about 
controversies in terms of how do you assess reliability and to what extent do you need to assess reliability to basically continue uh, working around nuclear weapons. So those, those are types of discussions that you might want to also engage with based on like newly released primary documents. Okay, thank you. Do you have other questions? Yes, please. Very good. Hi, um, my name is Oliver. I'm doing a Master of International Economic Policy here. And I'm from Australia. Um, we're talking a lot about when, um, I mean, we seem to be talking a lot in the future, and I'm sort of wondering, what is the current situation in, in countries like China, Egypt, um, the US, for example, where the treaty hasn't yet been ratified? I mean, are, they, are legislators talking about it? I'm wondering if you can just shed a bit of light on that and subsequently tell us a little bit about what your organization is doing. Uh, are, you, are you having conversations with legislators? I mean, what is the actual position, um, practically speaking, that is being done to make sure that all, uh, all countries ratify it? Uh, thank you. Thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, discussion. I'm uh, Jeffrey Buckle, study international public management, and I was wondering uh, who you regard, uh, which country in the world as the most uh, dangerous nuclear threat? Okay. 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 Thank you for uh, bringing this question because I just recall that I forgot to answer uh, Wang's question on China and my visits. Uh, <coughs> Look, we, um, for the eight remaining countries, we're doing our best uh, to, you know, talking to them, uh, trying to find the condition of trust uh, to influence a little bit uh, domestic understanding of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the verifiability of the treaty. And uh, in China, uh, I don't think this is necessary anymore. China, as I said, they're ready to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. I want to quote Ambassador Shah, who has been in the negotiation of the treaty. He often tells me when we talk about the CTBT ratification, he said, look, uh, Lassina, you know, if US ratify at 12, at 1201, China will ratify. I mean, He's probably saying this uh, uh, laughing. But I mean, it tells you a little bit the dynamic between countries. That China and the US are probably in the situation where they're looking into each other with regard to how to move forward for reasons that are personal to them, domestic to them, with regard to their bilateral relations. And uh, what I got uh, from China uh, last week uh, when I met uh, Foreign Minister Wang He is China's unwavering support to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. China, we built station for 15 years in China. For the first time in the history of the organization and the IMS, we certify five stations in one year. Certifying five stations means that China had to contribute data to the international monitoring system for a year so that it be tested, meeting uh, basically the technical specification of an international monitoring system facility and then be certified. And this is what we've done. And this is unprecedented. And in my discussion with Foreign Minister Wang He, he opened the door to further certification and then to the completion of the international monitoring system portion of China. And it's a sign of their commitment. It's a sign of China's uh, probably uh, way to show the leadership that is necessary for the country of this magnitude. And this is why I went on uh, to saying that a small step from a big country is a huge step for the international community. So China is a huge country. The small step they do makes a difference in the international community. I'm just hoping that further small step will come so that we get to that level of movement that will shake the international community towards the entry into force of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Uh, we're doing the same with Israel. 
I uh, visited Israel and had a chance uh, to talk to Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, they went on at saying that the ratification of the CTBT is not a matter of if, but when. It's a small step, but we shouldn't neglect that step, because it was if. At least it was perceived as if. If it's not if anymore, it's when. Let's just hope that the when is sooner rather than later. And this is our hope, and this is what we're doing with other remaining countries, except we haven't been or had any step forwards with India and the DPRK. Pakistan is an observer to the CTBT. We take that as a small step as well in the right direction. And then we're doing the same. The US, we have with the US lab continuous, continuous, continuous great cooperation. We're doing a lot of, um, uh, how we say, computer, uh, I mean, revising the international data center application software and then trying to bring them up to speed all together, not only with the US, but with France and many other countries. And then we're trying to build the trust that is necessary in this country to change the dynamic that will consider uh, the ratification of the CTVT. So what is the most dangerous nuclear threat today? Uh, I think uh, I don't want to be, you don't need to be Albert Einstein to know that DPRK is probably the biggest threat in terms of uh, developing nuclear weapon today. This is the one that is so obvious to all of us. And uh, let's see how this can be mitigated. And let's see how we can be en route again uh, to securing a better place for ourselves and then for future generations. Dr. Zawo, I have a short one for you. Uh, precisely as to, as to the Pakistan case. <coughs> Pakistan is an observer, mm -hmm. but what does being an observer to CTBT legally and practically means? What's the difference now? Can you explain us this? Um, being an observer uh, basically gives you the right to participate to the meeting, but the only right that you don't have is to vote in terms of multilateral diplomacy. And Pakistan doesn't have, uh, uh, I think, we're not uh, contributing, we're not sharing data with the country because they don't have a national data center. But I think things have been dynamic. Uh, and uh, with the changing world, things are changing as well. I want to share with you that we have more Pakistani youth group members and Indian youth group members than any other country. And sometimes you would ask yourself why. Those are two countries that have not even signed the treaty, and yet youth group, youth of, from those countries are participating more on the CTBT. So they've asked me, but Mr. Zerbo, we can't work in your organization. We can't do internship in your organization. We can't learn about your organization to go and change the dynamic in our country. So I went on to asking our PREPCOM, which is our governing body, to change this framework in a way where we can interact with countries that have not signed the treaty to bring them close. If you want a country to be part of your organization, why do you stop them from even coming to the training that you do or allowing youth from those countries to learning more about the treaty? Because what you want, you want youth to learn so that they can change the dynamic in their countries. And I think the PREPCOM has adopted this. Uh, we'll try and get uh, interns from those countries that have not signed, or it will probably start by those who are observers to the treaty. And uh, we don't employ people who are not signatory of the CTBT. Uh, that's another benefit that they don't get but they come to our boards and then discussion, and then they've been to the 20 years anniversary celebration of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. They come to Group B, but their participation is more subtle and then probably more discreet than that of other countries. But things can change any time, and you know, this is uh, what multilateral diplomacy is all about anyway. Then permanent representatives from Pakistan in Vienna do attend your meetings, and. But doesn't Qu quietly, quietly, but they don't present credential to me. Sure, okay. okay. Because they're not a signatory state. Okay. And actually, they do? No, they don't. No, no, I, I mean, don't receive. I mean, they do attend? They do attend. Okay. They do attend, yeah. 
Okay, do we have uh, maybe one or two last questions before closing our event? Benoit, do you want to add something? No, I'm good, thank no, you. You're good? Dr. Zerbo, do you want to conclude? Do you want to, to close? Do you want to add something? No, just to say uh, thank you for those who are probably rushing to go for the Valentine dinner <laughs> uh, with the loved one. Uh, to say thank you for being with us and then thank you for having spent uh, this amount of time on a special day for your generation. Uh, when I was coming up, I, say, I saw many of you with uh, roses. Uh, so I'm sure you're rushing to go back to your festive uh, evening. And I want to thank you and then thank you for your interest to arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament and tell you that uh, I hope to welcome some of you as interns at the CTBT and then we can continue the discussion and uh, you will help us finish that marathon in getting this treaty into force. Thank you. Thank you very much.